Breen has an hour interview with Jeremy Lin. And uh, Mike Breen now has about a 20-minute interview on the Michael K Show. Nice. Mike, it's Michael, Don, and Peter. How are you today? Hi, Mike. Hi, Don. Oh, no, are you? Peter. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, no. Told you he was listening. Oh, no. He listens to everything. It was a mistake. It was just a mistake, Mike. Uh, <laughs> I can't keep a straight. I can't keep a straight face. I'm sorry, Peter. <laughs> just too good a guy. Got scared. My heart's How are you guys second. doing? Great. How are you handling um, quarantine? Oh, I'm fine. I'm everything's. You know, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm at home. My family's healthy, uh, and just praying uh, that everybody that's that's smart in this country figure this out and get us back to uh, to what we should be doing. Do you believe there's going to be NBA basketball? Just a gut feeling. I'm not asking if you have any inside knowledge. I don't know if anybody has inside knowledge. What's your gut feeling? Um, I'll say I'm optimistic uh, because I know that they will do everything and anything uh, to try and, and get the season resumed. I, I think they're desperate to crown a champion. But I'm also very, very confident and, and actually quite comforted by Adam Silver being in charge because I know that if there's the slightest chance – of uh, safety issues, then it won't happen. They'll do everything uh, in their power to, to make sure it is, and then if that's the case, then they'll have a season. But if not, he won't take any chances. I, I just have this feeling, um, Mike, when I look at the comments from all the different commissioners, they're saying the same thing. I, I really believe that when they restart, it'll be everybody baseball hockey basketball i don't know i don't know if anybody wants to take that plunge by themselves do you do you feel the same way that that when one moves the other will move alongside i, I do don uh, just like it was when one moved to postpone everybody followed suit mm -hmm. um, you know obviously golf has has events scheduled fairly uh, soon so they'll be the first ones to go and, and that's obviously a different a different sport in terms of contact and, and being outside etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but I, I do think that, uh, and most importantly, so much of the decisions of all the various commissioners have nothing to do with the sports themselves. It has to do with the, the health and medical people and what they're able to uh, come up with in terms of vaccines, um, uh, easy testing, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, most of it is out of their hands. And they're relying on, on our brilliant medical people in this country um, to figure something out that will enable them to make that decision. All right. So let's say that the NBA returns and, and their playoffs. And let's just assume, and I'm not sure, this is just an assumption, that the broadcasters are on site. And I, I can't see the NBA and the NHL coming back and playing with fans in the stands. So yesterday was the anniversary of the game in Baltimore that they played in front of an empty stadium because of the riots. And we had Gary Thorne on like a month ago, and he said that he had a call of an uh, Adam Jones double, and then Adam Jones was on second base and yelled up to the press box, be quiet, we can hear you. Will you be self-conscious if you're calling the game and the players could actually hear you? Um, I, I don't know, because I've never done it. I, I don't think so. Uh, and quite honestly, when the players are out there uh, and they're going at it, there's a, there, there is some noise. I don't know if you remember um, a couple of years ago, the Knicks did a, did a uh, promotion where they didn't play any music or anything else during the first half of the game. And it was just the crowd. Now, it had a, a packed house, so the crowd could cheer. But you could still hear more on the court. Uh, if you were down by the court, then you normally would. There was no music. There was no the promotions, uh, no announcements. So um, that felt strange. I can't imagine how it would be without the crowd. I also remember in, in Sacramento a couple of years ago, they had, uh, they had a police shooting that was being protested, and there were protesters outside, and they shut the building down from people coming in. Now, some people had already been in, so there were some in the crowd, but very, very few. Uh, so there have been instances like that, but nothing like like that we would experience if this is what's going to happen. And, and I have I have no idea. I hope I won't hold anything back. I hope I have the same energy and enthusiasm to make a call. Uh, but until you do it, it's it's hard to it's hard to do. By the way, can can I say something? Sure, please. Um, I'm listening. I've been listening a lot to you guys with all this because I'm obviously home every day. And Michael, your voice 
sounds as strong as it was before you went through the surgery. Do you feel that way, that it's strong? I do. Thank you. Yeah, I do feel. Thank God. Well, uh, thank God. Thank your surgeon. And I also think you should thank Don because now with the show, with Don talking as much as he does during great the point. show, a great that, wow. that you don't talk as much, and I yep. think it saves your voice wow. where it's really strong. I'm really, I'm really disappointed. <laughs> I'm really, because he put you up to that, and I, I at least thought that I had some respect from you <laughs> that you wouldn't do it. Because you can't, you can't possibly Peter, what do you have that this? opinion. He this really can't least? possibly best have appear- that opinion. Best so, appearance we've ever had from Mike. I, 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 I'm, I'm just, I'm disappointed. I'm really. I'm re- that's the word. Was it word. that obvious? I didn't Thank put you, you up to it. <laughs> you had to. <sighs> Mike would never. He's too nice a guy. He's very funny though. And it's not. It's not true that I talk more than you. It can't possibly be no, true. No, that that, it, that part's true, Don. Seventy percent might be strong, but you can't right, say it's you know not what? true. Then, then then tomorrow will be very interesting. <laughs> You've said well, this he keeps so many promising times. this, and he yeah. never does. We've it. never gotten the day. Um, he can't control himself. <laughs> the, the key is it's now in his head. Now, right, Don, so. it, but don't don't do not change one iota, Don. You're fantastic. Do not change. Thank you. I I appreciate that. Uh, I I don't I don't think this will be the case on ABC for the finals. But I, I could see a possibility of if there are regular season games being played to finish up the schedule of announcers doing it off the monitor. Could you see that as a possibility? Yeah, in fact, I think that's there's a, a real good chance of that happening, especially early when it's first returned. You know, as you guys said when you when you initially brought this up, nobody knows. So anybody saying what they think is going to happen, they, they just don't know. And, and things can change so quickly. It can change so quickly for the better. And all of a sudden, uh, there's medical things out there that allow us to, to almost get back to normal right away. And then, uh, obviously, things can change quickly for the worse if one player gets gets tested uh, during the, the the bubble city, wherever they're going to play, if that's the case, and, and, and it goes the other way. So it's impossible to tell. But it, it does, like I said, it, it does appear at least initially – uh, there's a good chance that we'll be we'll be taking or calling games off a monitor. Have you done that before, Mike? You know, the only time I ever did that was, um, you know, you do auditions with new analysts, and they wanted to try somebody out during an mm. off season. And I've done that a few times where you sit and you call a game off a monitor, and that's that's so different because it's not a live game, uh, and you're not really broadcasting to an audience. You're broadcasting to to get a feel for can this guy or gal do a, um, you know, do a game. So it's, right. it's completely who was, different. Who was the worst uh, that you worked with that they tried out that you just said, wow, that's terrible? Yeah, he oh, I'm not going to say that. They were, they were all wonderful in their own way. Oh. When they, when the, the Rangers had a couple of games in, in Europe that I called with Dave off the monitor and then the World Cup of Hockey for ESPN. The only thing that was different was my prep because I like the morning skate. I like getting a chance to to kind of get a feel for stuff going into the game. That was missed, but off the monitor, it, w- it wasn't bad. Matter of fact, sometimes the angles, you know, could actually be better. Than, well, than you know, that's, a, that's an interesting thought, and, and you're right about the preparation, and, you know, because for, for most uh, broadcasters who call games, you know, you could do all your preparation before you get to the arena, but the majority of, of the stuff that you use for that particular game is, is what you get when you get to the arena and talk to people. It's it's incredible how much of that stuff is used as opposed to the other stuff. Um, so I agree with that. And, and you know, it's it's when you're calling a game on television – you're watching the game live, but you also have to go back and forth to the monitor all the time because you have to be uh, the eyes of what the people at home are seeing. So you can't, if something's going on that's on the monitor and you're watching something else, that's not good. So it forces you to watch exactly what everybody is at home watching. So there is some benefit from that standpoint. Now, Don, you respect Mike, like, so much, right? Yes. So maybe his answer to this might change your opinion. So he mentioned Dave, and Dave's a great analyst on the Rangers on radio, but constantly steps all over Don's calls. Constantly. Don's fine with it. He said it, it adds well, flavor. It, it, How would you RJ feel have an example? if Van Gundy or Mark ju- ju- all over a call that you made in the finals? Um, they, uh, they, it's an amazing thing because most analysts, when you're, when you're emotional, it's hard to, to hold it back. 
Um, it's amazing. Jeff and Mark have never had that problem. Even when they first started doing the broadcasting, they never did that. So I've, it, it, it's never been a problem with them. Not not one time at the end of a game, uh, you know, in a big play, have they have they yelled over the call. They wait, and then they come in. I mean, well, if somebody did it, you would stiff arm the guy. I'm pretty much certain of that. No, 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 no. But it, 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 I mean, sometimes you can't help it because you're overcome by emotion, and that's understandable. But if it's at the end of a game, uh, and it's you know an important call, you just you, you always have uh, what I've done in the past is you always have talks with your analysts, and you'll say, hey, just uh, let me finish the call. I'll get out quickly, and then you can come in with whatever you want, and you give them room, and you have that conversation when you first start working with somebody. Yeah, Don's afraid of Dave, so he will not have that. That, that is true, but I think sometimes <laughs> it accentuated. R- R- RJ, play, play one quick and, and tell me that, he didn't, that Dave didn't add to the call. A long-distance shot is saved by Flurry, and the rebound gets yeah. knocked away, and then Pooley out with the rebound, scores in overtime. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you do you do love his emotion on radio, on radio it's it's it makes it more difficult because you know sometimes you, if you're listening on radio you're relying on every particular detail being told to you so it, it seems more egregious when it's done on radio than it was on tv oftentimes how many times have you watched a game on on television and it's a big call at the end and especially if it's a team you're rooting for and say the, the player on your team hits the shot, you're screaming so loud you don't hear the call. And I've done this where, like, I'm going crazy, and I have to rewind to go back and hear the call because I didn't hear it live because I was so excited myself as a right. fan uh, yelling at the television. Now, uh, getting back to the finals, let's say the playoffs are, are played at a remote location, Mike. Let's just say Vegas where they have, like, a biodome. And uh, ABC and ESPN said, listen, we, we want you to, at the sites to call the games. And you'd have to be there for a month, quarantine. Would you be okay with that? Yeah, if, if that's what the job entails, uh, I would do it. I, and I wouldn't be worried from a safety standpoint at all because I'm, again, confident, like I said about Adam, Adam Silver with the NBA. I'm the same with the people at ESPN. They would never ask us to do something where safety wasn't 100%. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, it, it wouldn't be ideal, certainly, but if if that's the circumstances that we have to work under because of this historic time that we're in, then that's my job, and I'll do it. The the Jeremy Lin stuff is just so fascinating to me. I, I, don't, I don't think I ever remember a, a reg, regular season span of time that just seems so important it was all encompassing mike all the phone calls we took on on the cover of sports illustrated back to back weeks is there anything that you can equate to just that what it ended up being a two or three week run of just every day he was doing something special it, it, nothing compares nothing don it was it was the most extraordinary stretch I've ever been a part of basketball wise, and I've said this a number of times now. I've been I've been so blessed to call you know much more important games, bigger games, historic games, all time games, whatever. Um, I've never had more fun calling NBA basketball than I did those, and it wasn't even really three weeks in terms of the actual insanity part. I mean, he he only played 35 games that season. He wound up missing the final, I think, 17 games when he suffered that knee injury. And it really was only about two and a half weeks when when it was at its peak, and then it started going the other way. Um, But it was the ultimate rags to riches stories. I, I said this on the air about it at the time. It's why we love sports. Here, this young man who was basically a fourth string point guard when they signed him, who thought he was going to get cut if he didn't play well against the Nets that night, and most likely he would have been cut. And he turns into maybe, at least for a two-week stretch, the most famous athlete, not just in the country, not just in the NBA, but in the world. I mean, he, was, he became this global sensation overnight. Uh, and I've never seen anything like it. And it was so much fun because, uh, you know, he was this underdog who, who rose up to this incredible level. But at the same time, it wasn't an individual uh, success story. It was a team success story. It was this team that was struggling. And all of a sudden, this young man leads him to seven wins in a row. It had every bit. It was, it was the Hollywood script that people would have been sitting there saying, oh, this is too corny. Please give me a break. 
but it was true. And um, yeah, I, I just I look it back at so fondly, <clears throat> uh, so fondly look back at it that um, a guy that played 35 games total in his Nick career. Uh, has a special place in his heart for every Nick fan. Well, now, you, I, we, spoke, we, you spoke with him for an hour, and that's going to be tomorrow on MSG. Anything he said that surprised you, Mike? Well, it was supposed to be a, a half hour, and he was so open and candid and so into the conversation. You know, he, he clearly, and I remember this when he was with the team, and I've seen him quite a bit, obviously, when he bounced around the NBA after he left the Knicks. Uh, very intelligent young man, but he was always very guarded. Um, but he wasn't the other night. I, I was, I just was blown away by how how open he was. And, and there were a couple of things. And one, the, the the thing that really struck me that I didn't know, you know, was when he left. You know, the, he was a, a, a restricted free agent, so the Knicks could have matched the offer. But Houston, the way they constructed the contract with that poison pill, it just it would have been ridiculous for the Knicks to match it. It would have been an awful contract. Um, so they couldn't do it. But when he, after he agreed to the Rockets' contract, he called his his agent, realizing the Knicks probably aren't gonna aren't gonna match it, and said to them, "You got to change the contract. You got to make it less. You got to make it less money." I mean, what player has ever done that? And because he wanted to, he really wanted to come back to New York. But that was the only deal that he was offered at the time. So his agent took it and didn't want to go back on the agreement. So that so, that was one of the things that struck me. And the other things. Um, he's very candid about how um, he handled the Lynn sanity uh, because after even that first game, that first game against the Nets, it changed his life forever. And there were things that, that he, he liked what he did, but there were a lot of things he didn't like what he did. And, and that part of the, the conversation I found very compelling because he, he's not afraid to look in the mirror and see his flaws and see where he, he failed. And he feels that it, it, it made him a better person today. We talked about this the other day, and, and Michael was talking about that, you know, with Nick's ownership, they've seemed to hold on to a little bit of a grudge with Jeremy Lin. And I'm sort of of the mindset that at some point they really have to make this right with him. Um, he's, a, he's a guy who I imagine, Mike, would get a standing ovation in the garden for the rest of his life, no? Well, when he's returned with other teams, he was always warmly greeted, and, and there was always a lot of Lynn jerseys in the stands when he would return. Um, you know, there were some people that would occasionally boo him because, you know, they thought, oh, he left the Knicks. But it really, you know, it really wasn't his doing in, in some aspects. And you can't blame the young man. He got this incredible deal. Um, and you can't blame the Knicks for not resigning because of the way it was structured. So, but I, I've seen him come back, Peter, quite a few times where he is, he's really welcome. But, it, you know, maybe... At some point, when he comes back after he retires, he's not any other. Then, then people will do it. But uh, again, it's just it's mind-boggling to me that that uh, a player who played 35 games for a franchise is, is such a big part uh, of so many people's experience. When you ask them, "Oh, what are your favorite moments as a Nick fan?" I mean, that's always for so many people who live through that. Yeah. That's right up near the top of the list, if not at the top. Is there any um, any mention at all whatsoever, Mike, um, about Carmelo? Is there any animosity? Because Carmelo didn't make it easy on him when he came back off the injured list. No, um, and, and you know, again, there, there's so many things that weren't. I, I didn't ask him specifically about Carmelo. I did ask him about regrets and and how difficult it was when it started going sideways. And he has never mentioned Carmelo as as a problem. He's always said Carmelo was. Uh, was always professional and good with them, but it was clear that their their um, basketball styles, the way they played the game, uh, just didn't mesh. And Carmelo wouldn't budge and wouldn't play more of the way Mike D'Antoni wanted them to play with Jeremy Lin. Hence, why uh, Mike D'Antoni resigned. And then when Mike Woodson took over, he went right back to you know Carmelo Anthony, Armari Stoudemire isolation more of the hero ball type stuff and you know to Woodson's defense it was it really worked I think I forget what how they finished the season but you know they finished the season strong going back to that after after they had some stumbles so and then they won 54 the next year correct right so you know it's it's um sometimes it's it's a system's fault sometimes it's a player's fault do I think Carmelo Anthony personally should have uh, adjusted his game more to suit a guy that had brought so much success, absolutely. I think long-term uh, they would have been better. 
but you know it, it just didn't happen and unfortunately it, it caused a coaching change and uh, and Jeremy Lin's tenure with the Knicks wound up being a lot shorter than everybody thought. Well, Mike, we thank you for sharing some time with us. That's tomorrow, the interview at 5.30, another Lynn game after that. And I know that one of the more difficult things of the quarantine is that that we can't hug it out. So, But we will at one point. Well, when? Well, at, at one, well, when there's a vaccine, that's when I'll touch you. Really? That's yeah. the first time? Probably, yeah. Wow. So if you both test negative, you're not hugging them? Uh, well, if, if we both test question, negative Doc. the it's exact same question. time, Exact same time that I will hug him, but if he tests negative one day and I'm the next, I'm not sure I'd risk it. Wow. All right. You're not missing much, Mike. We've We've gotten to know each other pretty well these seven weeks, Mike. It's (laughs) it's not a pretty picture. A lot of ugliness. Finishing this interview on a downer. Holy Yeah, really. Well, you're good talking. Okay. Well, you you would hug me. Yeah. Would you hug me right now? Yeah. You would? Yeah. All right, I'd hug you back. All right. You're a liar. But anyway. Oh, thanks, uh, one Mike. quick thing. You're a big Met fan, right? So yeah. Pete Alonso came out in an interview and said he thinks that the Mets have to bring back the alternate black uniforms. They're great. Oh. Do you agree or disagree? I know Don hates that. This is a generation generational thing. I'm I'm all for tradition. Keep the regular stuff. But if you asked probably, uh, if you asked my my youngest son Matt, he would probably agree with Alonso. And if you ask most of the people in the younger generation, they would absolutely agree. The old stogies like me, I would say, uh, or old fogies, old fogies like me would say, no, we got to keep the traditional. I don't like those. But I, I get the traditional, thing. and I love the pinstripes too. And I wish they'd keep that. But I, I'm I'm cool with the orange jersey. I just had a problem with bringing in a color that's not even a part of the scheme uh, with the team. I mean, that, oh, I, that's I, silly. Yeah, I, I agree 100. percent But I just just. Give, give me the the traditional Mets jersey. That's the only one I want. But again, it's it's all generational. Mike, stay safe, my friend. We'll yes. talk soon. Okay, guys. Thanks. All right.